All right. Um, in, in the old days, when I first started teaching this class, I actually wouldn't include this chapter because I figured this is something that everyone already knows quite a bit, right? North America, um, probably all elementary school, junior high, and high school probably were taught a bunch of the stuff that we'll go over. Um, but actually, through time, there was enough things that students didn't seem to, to know that much, so I, I decided to bring it back in. Plus, there's lots of, lots of really interesting concepts. This chapter actually takes the chance to kind of really dig in deep into some of the concepts uh, because the authors know that you're kind of aware in general of what this area is like. All right. uh, different textbooks have different cutoffs for where they consider North America or not. Uh, for me, you know, old school North America, well, I would, I would cut it off here because this is technically the North American continent. Um, our book, well, kind of cuts us off here. Uh, our book makes the, the kind of proclamation that culturally this area is more connected to our next chapter. It's a fair argument. Uh, so what we have going on here physical geography wise, well, we have lots of things, right? We have well, in our region, we have Great Lakes, which is a lineage of the Ice Age, as again, I'm sure many of you have been taught through time. Um, glaciers came on down, um, carved out a bunch of large areas that were then filled with water when they retreated. Um, we also have, as you see here, well, Rocky Mountains. Anyone been, people have been to the Rocky Mountains? This is a couple places people have been to now, which is nice that we can talk about. Um, well, what you have here is you have a rain shadow, right? You have more rain in general on this side and less rain on this side because the mountains basically block the rain. <clears throat> um, two main mountain belts. Just go back real quick. As you can see here, Appalachian Mountains are actually quite a bit smaller, obviously, than the Rocky Mountains. Uh, part of that is because, um, well, these are... These are a bit older and they've actually been weathering down quite a bit through time. Uh, every place on earth gets weathered down somewhat, right? You have wind and erosion and just gravity pulling stuff down. So if you have a place that has really, really big mountains, uh, that's usually evidence that there's a lot of tectonic uplift in that area, a lot of new mountain building. When I say new, relatively new, right? 350 million years versus 40 million years. <clears throat> um, actually, let me get the maps. Not this one. Oh man, these are being really washed out again. I think I might dim these lights so that these are viewable maps. <clears throat> That's a little better. <clears throat> uh, well, Appalachian Mountains. Um, people have been to the Appalachians? All right. is, there, is, there, is Shenandoah part of the Appalachians? I believe so. I, I, I thought it was on mountain range because I would look at the whole know that though. Um, Appalachians, uh, lots of natural resources. That's one reason why it's um, you know mining country. <clears throat> All right. So what's going on here with the Rocky Mountains? Well, you have plates that are coming together, right? Plates that are coming together. When they come together, well, something's got to give. Something's got to go somewhere. Um, technically, the Continental Shelf is uh, a lighter type of rock material. As weird as that sounds, to think that these Rocky Mountains are lighter than the rock that is being shoved underneath them, uh, but they are. That's 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 why one is being shoved above, the other one is being shoved below. <clears throat> Death Valley. You ever been to Death Valley? No, that's the one that we got, John. Well, Death Valley, one of the driest areas. Um, Death Valley, again, is on the other side of the mountains where there's a rain shadow effect. Um, Death Valley, I've been there. I would recommend it. It's, um, you can't really see too much out here, but this is a picture from our textbook. These are salt flats, and they actually look a lot like a frozen lake when you're out walking on them, except for it's, of course, very hot. So it's a very kind of bit of a surreal experience for someone from Minnesota who's walked on lots of frozen lakes. Um, Basically also what has happened in this area, not only is it a rain shadow, but very often if you have tectonic uplift of mountains like the Rocky Mountains, you'll have an area next to it that because of that uplift, it just kind of sinks down a bit. Um, 
happens quite a bit next to, next to mountains. <clears throat> Climate of North America, um, well maps are always better than anything else. I already mentioned about the, the Ice Age, um, carving out the lakes. Uh, again, like I said, probably a lot of people from Minnesota know this. Uh, this glaciation process, when you see it in maps and stuff, it makes it seem like it was a very simple, like glaciers came down and the glaciers retreated. But the, the process was actually much more complicated. There was much more glaciers kind of moving a little bit, moving back, moving a little bit, moving back. Um, and basically like dragging around a lot of landforms. If you ever go on hikes in some of these areas, you can still see the striations on rocks. That's when the glaciers came through. Uh, well, they would very often be dragging rocks and whatnot, and so they would create these big grooves as they would drag them along. So if you're ever walking out and about and you see like great big grooves on rocks, if they're all going one way, that's pretty good evidence that those are from glaciers. <clears throat> coastal plain. Well, like many other areas of the world that we've looked at, uh, these coastal plains, um, great for agriculture. Really good, uh, good uh, not only is it good growing weather, um, but very good soils. <clears throat> uh, precipitation. We actually have a thing similar to, um, if you remember when we were talking about the monsoon effect uh, and about how that happens in different places, just not as extreme, we actually have a monsoon effect that happens and part of the reason why we get a lot more rain seasonally uh, but it's not as strong of an effect obviously we're not having flooding like like you would necessarily see in india um, and you're also not seeing a really strong dry season like you would see in india or elsewhere uh, let me point out something else on this precipitation map you can see a lot of rain right all the way from alaska all the way down to the coast uh, this is orographic precipitation it's a term that's been used before, but it's brought up in this book and I think finally defined. Oral graphic precipitation is just, if you have an air mass coming in that has some moisture, it's pushed up. When it's pushed off, it cools off and the air squeezes out that water. So you get a lot of water and then by the time it gets to the other side of these mountains, uh, it's become quite dried out, right? So you could have a lot of rain on one side, a lot less on the other. <clears throat> this is another map from our book, and it looks more complicated than it is. When it comes to air masses, in a nutshell, if an air mass is coming from the north, it's cold. If an air mass is coming from the south, it will be warm. Also, in general, if an air mass is coming over land, it's going to be drier. If it's coming from water, it's going to be moist, right? Very logical, very simple. Kind of an overly complicated map, but pretty simple concepts. Um, the all all of this continent was, uh, well, not all the continent. Most of this continent was very forested, um, very very forested before uh, these woods were cut down, including here in Minnesota. Minnesota was mostly forests. Um, and again, the other side of that rain shadow desert areas. Um, and there's still lots of forested areas, of course, today, uh, here and there. This image is a good example when I was talking about orographic precipitation. Again, the air mass pushed out, precipitate out, right? And you can see that happening in this picture, and then you can't really see about the other side being drier, right? So if you ever see little, if you see mountain peaks, that seem to have like a little hat of a cloud, just kind of all the time. That's uh, orographic precipitation. Climates in North America. Then you can see this whole area here that is on the other side of the rain shadow. Uh, you have obviously some desert and then steppe climates. Um, when we talk about steppe climates, and we've talked about steppe climates kind of a lot in other areas of the world, those are the places that you can have some good agriculture if you irrigate, but you gotta be careful because it still tends to be dry and you can overutilize those resources. People heard of the Dust Bowl? 
Could anyone say anything about the Dust Bowl? What it is? What, what, what does that mean? Yeah. Period of long drought along the too much topsoil um, cultivation and high winds created basically a dust bowl and like what you know as like a desert storm with the sand blowing across the western or the Midwest plain. Yeah. Um, so there was a, a ton of farming and farms set up in this area. Uh, and then when they first put in a bunch of dams and whatnot and got a lot of irrigation, you had bumper crops for a while because there's decent soils. Um, but these are areas that also, if you're gonna, you can have a drought and you can have a drought that goes on for years. Um, well, what you had here is you had a whole bunch of bumper crops uh, and then a lot of the soils were overutilized. Uh, they, they, they were starting to run out of nutrients, starting to kind of break down and get more sandy. And actually, there are a whole bunch of warnings about this by scientists and people who lived on the land. Uh, and they're actually, Washington, D.C. was basically denying that there was a problem and denying that anything was happening until there was a big enough dust storm that it actually brought dust all the way to Washington, D.C. And when it was on the Capitol steps, it was more difficult for people to deny that it was happening. Uh, but by that point, you know, we had gotten kind of too late, and a lot of these populations had to migrate to different states. <clears throat> this is another uh, image from the book, uh, Fort Simpson. It talks about how a lot of the first um, a lot of the first places that Europeans lived in different areas. Uh, were the different forts. Um, people have been out to Fort Snelling. Fort Snelling at all? Um, well, if you get a chance, you should head out there. Uh, wait until it's warmer out. Uh, but it's, it's a lovely place. Lots of historical recreations there. Um, so let's see. We've actually talked about this topic quite a bit. Um, but to, to refresh your memory, uh, there is lots of European diseases that were introduced to these continents, right? And so you had a large amount of people die. Um, and these are again, were animal born, right? So these are ones, well, if you remember from guns, germs, and steel, smallpox, typhus, diphtheria, measles, all kinds of things were deadly local populations who had no immunity to these. Um, these days, these are, they're considered childhood diseases mostly, and there's various vaccinations for them, uh, if you can get people to, to stay vaccinated. Um, I actually went to a couple of these different sites uh, just to kind of show examples. Um, actually, for Minnesota specifically, but the book talks about a lot of the early fur trading. Fur trading is one of the main ways that Europeans started coming to this region and started trading uh, mostly for, for beavers. Um, there were, well, hats and, and other things were made out of beaver skins. As you might be able to imagine, this being an aquatic mammal, uh, the fur is really good against the elements. Um, so really popular for, for hats. Uh, and that was, uh, that got a lot of traders into this region. Um, and they actually, the part of the reason they started coming in here is because Europe did have beavers that they were making their own hats out of, uh, but they hunted them to extinction. Uh, so then they went elsewhere rather than managing their resource. Right? These are kind of like how, how we come to figure out these lessons through time of uh, overextending steppe climate resources or overhunting a specific animal. We still, of course, have beavers here. We're not hunted to extinction. Uh, these are some of the hats that were very popular. Um, I went up to Grand Portage. Anyone been up to Grand Portage? One of the first big kind of forts in Minnesota. Um, well, they had examples of uh, indigenous, indigenous uh, housing. Uh, it, it was really quite interesting because uh, I would have not been aware until I had gotten there that a lot of these structures were made out of very large pieces of birch. You know, you probably have been walking and you know how birch, you can kind of peel the, peel the uh, bark off, right, in big long sheets. Well, 
before they were cut down, these birch trees used to be huge. And you could take off huge areas and create whole walls and structures out of just birch bark that were very hardy. <clears throat> Um, so while this first trading, um, the traders would bring in a lot of different resources. The things that were most popular were anything that involved metalworking, uh, because the indigenous populations did not have a knowledge of metalworking. Now, if you can imagine how more, well, easy life is if, for example, if you have a needle for a thread, uh, instead of having to use a piece of bone, which was used before, right? So these things were wildly popular. Just things like, you know, just the conveniences that need metal. Very popular. Um, the book talks about a lot of different treaties through time. A lot of different treaties were made with different ind indigenous groups. Um, but these treaties, if you read up on all the details and stuff, they're a real kind of crazy hodgepodge. Um, the book talks about how treaties were made with different local chiefs, right? Um, have, has anyone ever heard of the term a maid chief? Probably not. Well, these treaties, you would have a European, for example, come to Minnesota, uh, and they would just kind of like interact with local indigenous populations. And if they met one who was relatively friendly and would trade, those Europeans would say, would just declare that that person is a local chief. Uh, and then they would trade with that person, and this person could just be anybody. Could just be anybody as long as they are indigenous. And then a lot of these treaties and whatnot were signed with these local people who were picked by Europeans, but who were not actually representatives of any local tribes. Uh, and so when it comes to legal paperwork, it's like, well, how does that, how did that make sense? Well, it made sense just because uh, the United States wanted to expropriate prop property from people, right? <clears throat> All right? Another book from, uh, map from the book of American Indian reservations in the United States. Um, and sometimes these give the false impression that this is where most Native Americans were at earlier times and whatnot, but these are just more areas that people were forced to go. But there's actually, although you can see, of course, there's reservations within the United States, and a lot of these were different agreements with different local tribes, uh, but actually a great deal of Minnesota's Native Americans live um, today up in Canada because uh, they were forced to march out, uh, especially ones who lived in the southern part of the state. Um, this is some more uh, pictures of uh, up at Grand Portage, one of the first forts. It's repairing a little boat. Some of the games that they used to play. Um, and they would all have these big packs that would be used for trading. Um, and they'd bring in, like I said, things that were made out of metals. Actually, I think I got a picture of the supplies that they would bring down. Um, so I'll give you an example of how popular it was to trade. I don't know if you could see that this is, this is a bowl, uh, and it's made out of birch bark. Uh, and this was the primary thing that, uh, local indigenous populations would cook food in, right? You'd have an open fire and you'd make a pot out of birch, uh, bark and you'd have to tie it up. Very labor intensive and usually this would last a meal but you couldn't really reuse it because it'd be falling apart too much, you know? Um, but you would use it to cook a meal. Now you can imagine how popular metal pots would be to a population where they'd have to remake their, their, what they would eat out of for each meal. If you can get something that you could just rinse out at the end, right? 
it was it seemed revolutionary uh and like uh well this was uh the head of a of a of a axe that was used for cutting down trees and whatnot uh and it was as you can see stone and you know it would do the job but compared to something that was metal uh metal was very very popular <clears throat> um the other thing with maps looking at reservations and whatnot it also kind of gives the impression that most uh, Native Americans live out in those areas. Uh, but actually, most Native Americans just live in the city and just like in regular housing and just, you know, uh, aren't on reservations. There's plenty that are, but most, most live more central. <clears throat> um, so interestingly, in all those different examples, we saw all kinds of different ways that basically indigenous populations were kicked off of their land. There were some places here and there that there were uh, agreements made uh, to be able to continue to use the land. That's part of where the whole reservation system came from. Um, and through time, it's actually through the courts that a lot of Native Americans have been able to get back land and back rights to use different land. Um, because these old treaties, they're still legal wording, right? And so if these old treaties say, well, you can um, use this land for hunting um, for forever, like if, if a treaty says that, uh, what they've been able to do is take that to court and get that enforced uh, and get rights to different uses of land back. <clears throat> um, the book also talks about the legalization of gambling uh, and how that has brought an amount of money but to certain areas and certain groups not all obviously uh, but now these you know these casinos are quite popular people have been to like a Native American casino Mystic Lakes or anything you know um, uh, Mystic Lakes will still have uh, local celebrations where people will dress in traditional regalia uh, if you ever get a chance, these are free and open to the public. Well, as this says, it's really difficult to generalize because there's so many different things that happen, so many different, um, as I said, some Native American groups were forced to completely leave the country, go to Canada, others were given land, uh, and a place to stay, not the best land, um, but there's all kinds of different things that happen. It's really place specific, put it that way. Um, in Canada, there was a similar system. You know, when we talk about empires, and when they take over areas, and they make the local populations assimilate culturally to that dominant, right? When we're talking about Russification and how the Russians we're making everyone learn Russian, adapt Russian cultural norms. Um, the United States and Canada did the same thing, very much in the mold of what empires do. Uh, uh, Canadian examples, um, and you could look at these northern territories. Um, these northern territories have uh, been able to, through time, um, take back a lot of their land rights, and actually, because they have a majority of the population, uh, they've been able to vote on a lot of kind of independence sort of movements. Um, and so the far north in Canada has a lot of, um, again, indigenous populations who are control of their local governments, uh, more than the southern half. Well, it wasn't until relatively recently uh, that Can Canada moved forward with actually encouraging a number of different indigenous groups um, basically to, to help them reacquire their own cultural norms, um, 
re-educate as far as their own indigenous languages. Uh, this has been a newer thing that Canada has been moving toward. Uh, Canada also did an official government apology to the native populations for uh, the past and what has happened. Uh, United States has not done anything like this. Um, like I said, these Northwest Territories here, um, a lot of local indigenous populations have taken charge of their local governments. <clears throat> um, this has actually been in the news a lot lately. A lot of these different boarding schools, people see this in the news, the different old Native American boarding schools that children were, children were forced to go to, to assimilate. Um, well, they're in the news because there's been uh, bodies found uh, children's bodies uh, from from this period of time uh, and there's they're still looking into what exactly happened if, what populations were killed off in these boarding schools uh, this is just an old picture well it's not a picture a drawing of Fort Snelling um, local indigenous housing similar to what I showed you in the recreation. Um, so migration, this chapter talks a lot about migration because there's lots of good examples and examples that people already know a lot about. Um, forced migration versus voluntary migration. They're good terms because you could tell what they mean from, from the term itself, right? What forced migration is compared to voluntary migration. Um, there's been, of course, the history of both of these in the United States. Um, so the forced migration, there was, um, in, in popular publications that people of European ancestry within the United States would have, they'd be reading a lot of these stories that would really emphasize attacks from the Native Americans to European <coughs> populations. And a lot of these, well, were made up. A lot of them were exaggerated. They were for the effect of basically causing local fear um, and making a rationalization for taking property away from these groups of people, right? Um, yeah. I looked up some of the old ads um, that were getting people to to come up to Minnesota, um, migration of Europeans in the area. Well, after the first fur trading, um, it was mostly along the rivers and then increasingly along the railroads. Um, this is St. Anthony Falls, 1855. St. Anthony Falls is part of the reason that the Twin Cities are where they are, because those falls, uh, well, that's energy, right? If you remember the video I showed you about industrialization, running water was a very uh, good source of early energy for a lot of people. The book talks about city sites, city sites usually being on a fall line. Fall line meaning, I think there's a picture here. Oops. Um, so as these rivers move this way, right? This line here is where they have their falls. And so it is along that line that a lot of the first industrialization of the, in the United States happened. Um, in this area, uh, where we are over here, more in the center of the continent, we don't have a fall line that lines up with other fall lines. Uh, but it's the same concept, right? Falling water is energy. Uh, these are a lot of the populations that, uh, well, first came to Minnesota, mostly uh, lumber workers. Um, when I say lumber workers, well, they're, they're here to cut down the trees. At the time, the state was massively forested, all right? Uh, and it, it, it can boggle the mind when you look at the old pictures of how much wood, this is actually wood, they would put it down the river, uh, and people would go collect it down the river. And each piece of wood would actually have a little brand, which marked what company cut it, and so that company that then would get a 
percentage of how much it made later on, but huge areas of woods, huge areas of woods chopped down. Some of these were made into farming land, uh, but very often uh, they weren't great land. They'd be too sandy or whatnot. Um, the best agricultural land in Minnesota, as a, with a lot of other areas within North America, were actually places where agriculture had been practiced for generations before, and the land had been kept in relatively good repair. <clears throat> um, a lot of the Scandinavia uh, immigrants into Minnesota, when they came after all the trees had been cut down, there wasn't a lot of wood to build housing. Uh, and so this is an example of uh, a sod house. There are a lot of houses that were made out of sod, out of just the grass and the dirt, and you piled it up. Uh, but that's what people had. Um, I came across this ad, uh, getting, getting Minnesotans to join uh, the Civil War. It's kind of interesting. Uh, so our book talks about transportation changes through time, mostly because transportation changes really affected where people lived, where they moved to, um, what they had access to. Um, this is some of the early early trolleys that were happening locally. <clears throat> uh, another picture of St. Anthony Falls. <clears throat> um, so St. Anthony Falls is still back here. Um, so early development within the Twin Cities. This is downtown Minneapolis. This is Washington, uh, which used to be a, a big rail car area. And the area that is now the warehouse district that is mostly housing where people live, but it's called the warehouse district because that is where you'd have the trains come in and they'd store goods and things in the warehouses. Um, this is before today we have just in time manufacturing, which means you don't store a lot of stuff. You just plan out when your stuff is going to come in and so that it goes out immediately when it comes in. Uh, and so that's one of the reasons why, well, this whole area, became abandoned uh, for decades. And then it wasn't until, um, well, a lot of money was put into redeveloping. Um, and now it's kind of like the trendy place to live. Um. When we've looked at lots of different places around the world, we've seen places that are like shanty towns, right, and slums, lots of different names for them. The United States, we had a bunch of these as well. This is in Minnesota. Um, a lot of people, well, who didn't have any money or resources, they would self-make some housing, usually down by the river. Uh, and it would be down by the river for a number of different reasons, because it was still where you could walk to work. Uh, but also, no one would really fight you for this land because it would be, f it would flood a lot. And so the land didn't really have a lot of value. But it's similar to, like I said, when we see the rest of the world in self-built housing, being these kind of like little shacks. The main difference is in Minnesota, well, most of them have heat, right? Most of them have a little chimney because uh, that's only where you're going to be able to survive. Uh, but these used to be all over, especially by the river. All these different little shanty towns and stuff. There's not a lot of photos of them just because it wasn't a thing that people would photograph or talk about much. All right, so Twin Cities developing through time. Fauché Tower here being constructed. Um, I don't know if you've been to downtown Minneapolis much, seen the Fauché Tower. Right now, there are other buildings that are all surrounding it that are much larger, these giant buildings. At the, at the time, this was actually considered an extremely tall building, and it was a bit controversial. Part of the reason, I don't know if you noticed, that it has this kind of weird apron thing around it. Uh, when they built it, well, the city made the, the builder 
uh, make this area around it because it felt that this building was so tall that it could just collapse at some point. And so if you had this area around it, if it collapsed, it would just be damaging itself. Whereas if it was built on a corner and it collapsed, it might damage neighboring buildings. It's still standing, um, but at the time it was a revolutionary size of building. Um, and when we look at pictures from the rest of the world, when we look at roads and things, so this is Nicollet Avenue downtown. Um, this is for the, the crossing signals for vehicles. They used to have a person in there who would be switching the signals for people. And you still see that in lots of areas of the rest of the world that are developing. Um, and then this is, you could, I don't know if you can kind of tell, this is, this is in snow, this is, is dirt, you know? The roads were pretty simple. Um, our book talks about Fordism and Fordist production. Uh, and it might be a little, a little confusing because we also talk about industrialization and industrial manufacturing, the factory system, right? Some of the main differences, Fordist, Fordism, um, again, named after Ford, the guy who, who made a bunch of cars, right? Um, well, he did some unusual things. One thing he did was um, he paid his workers more, higher than the average salary. That's because um, working on the assembly line was really uh, arduous and difficult, and it was difficult to get people to want to do it unless you paid them more. Um, so the, the assembly line. Ford actually got the idea from, um, he went to um, a meat packing place, right? And when, when the meat is cut up, right, you take uh, an animal carcass and put it on a hook and you roll it down and they cut off a certain cut of meat, right? And you'll have someone there who's an expert on that cut of meat who's gonna cut it off, move it down, another person takes off another part, move it down, another person takes off another part, well, he saw that process and he said, well, what if we did the reverse? So this is why if you see old automobile manufacturing plants, you'll see them hanging on a thing. It's because it's the same model. You put the frame and you move it down, you have an expert on wheels who puts on the wheels. You move it down, you have an expert on steering wheel. They put that on, you move it down, right? So the assembly line process, very regimented, uh, very, very productive. Uh, but it was a different type of work than a lot of work had been. Um, and again, it was because it was higher wages, that meant the people who worked were able to become consumers and buy stuff. And that's when we talk about Fordist and Fordism, what we're talking about is <clears throat> people who work making stuff and they can afford to buy stuff that other people make and other people can then afford to buy what they make. And that basically you have a middle class that keeps the economy going, right? So when we talk about Fordism and Fordist, that's mostly what we're seeing. All right. Well, I've seen lots of eyes glaze over. So I think I'm gonna switch gears, have you work on some questions. Uh, but I'm gonna have you draw cards because it's early enough and this will get you talking to like new and interesting people and hearing their perspectives. And... All right. Well, Yeah, yeah, put the front. Put the front. Awesome.
see what kind of crazy groups we have. Uh, anyone draw pink? Pink. Two people? All right, your group will be fun. Purple. Oh, we got a good group. I think you're going to go back. There's a cluster of purple back there. That's good luck for St. Thomas, right? Reddish color, reddish. How about come over here? There's some empty seats. More people. How about blue? Blue. Blue, you're going to work with pink. There's two pink back there, since you're all by yourself. What color have I not said? Green. Green. It was green. There's like a cluster here, green. All right, let me get the questions up here for you to work on. It's pretty simple today. These ones, yeah. All right, find your groups, got your cards, hold them up to help yourselves identify. Just three questions. Yeah, if you want to type this up and I'll read it over your shoulder, that's fine. 